So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, back to our plenary uh, session this afternoon. It's very nice to see you. Uh, uh, how are you, Dirk? I'm sure you've had a, a very interesting uh, time uh, since we last met uh, in the uh, plenary. We've had some uh, very good meetings and provocative uh, debates. So, yesterday we had a very interesting uh, discussion between insurers and risk managers on the role of the insurance sector in supporting companies in their tradition. And today we are going to continue uh, addressing the uh, topic of ensuring this transition with our first guest who is live with us by video link. We're delighted to have the chairperson of EOPA, Petra Hilkema. Petra is with us, here she is, please. Um, a, a big round of applause from Copenhagen. Everybody can see you. Thank you so much for being with us. Now, uh, Petra, before I hand you over to Dirk, who's going to ask you uh, some questions, uh, can I just uh, uh, present you? I'm sure everybody knows you anyway, but uh, you started in your new position as chairperson of the European Insurance and Occupational Pensions uh, uh, Authority, that's IOPA, uh, in summer 2021. And before you became the uh, chairperson, you were the director for insurance supervision at the Dutch Central Bank, where you were responsible for the prudential supervision of the Dutch insurance sector. Also, important to say, you're the first woman uh, to take the chairmanship of uh, AOPA. We're delighted to have you. I'm going to let Dirk ask you a few questions, and then we'll take questions uh, for both of you uh, from the floor. So I'll hand over to Dirk. Dirk. Thank you, Alex, and uh, good afternoon, Petra. Many thanks again for taking the time to address the firma community, but also for addressing today the European insurance industry um, today, uh, all gathered here in Copenhagen. Um, it has been slightly over one year when you last time so kind to uh, speak to the Firma network. So what do you consider your achievements so far and what is IOPA working on to support the green and digital transition in Europe? Yes, uh, hi everyone. <laughs> hi Dirk. Uh, and uh, it's, it's great to be here. I'm very sorry it's not in person. Uh, that's something that I still need to uh, actually achieve uh, going forward, but I still have some time in this role. Um, but uh, if, if, I if I look back at the year uh, that has passed and naturally uh, uh, saying that I achieved things would be way too much. Uh, I do it with an organization. And so the first thing I think that I did was really um, better get to know the organization, the stakeholders, including uh, FERMA. I, I had some good meetings uh, as well as, um, also of course, the, the, the supervisors in Europe. I think that's the focus and that that's going better and better with uh, people being able to travel again. So that's first. On content, I think what we did is, uh, uh, first of all, we had to deal with, with the developments in the market, the end of COVID, to the extent you can call it an end. And, and of course, now the, the new macroeconomic economic environment because of the unprovoked war uh, of Russia on Ukraine. So I think that is a first, uh, and I think we are delivering here in monitoring and making sure um, we, we, we provide the information where needed also for decision making. So that's a first. But second, and, and then I'll, I'll get to your question on digitalization and sustainability. Um, and we just published a new strategy for the next three years. And I think what we did was as a, uh, we focused uh, on, on where our attention should be. And of course, when it then comes to digitalization and to sustainability. There's a lot to do, but let me mention a few on digitalization. I think it will be very much about data, uh, we, I think, are in a position that we have a lot of data on insurance, uh, on pension funds, but also uh, on, on pension and insurance gaps. So I think here is a big role to play, data-driven organization. And there's, of course, a, a lot of new technologies being used. And we need to understand those, but also understand how they're used and make sure that it's, it's a fair use on sustainability, but I think we will uh, get to, into that a, a bit more in the next questions. I think we uh, we do a lot in the regulatory framework, but also in assessing how insurance is or maybe is not uh, providing protection against uh, risks that come from ESG. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you already mentioned the same uh, gap, so IE protection gap, which was of course one of the core topics we discussed here. So um, maybe the next follow-up question is um, risk are assuming more and more 
uninsurable any longer, i.e. as a growing protection gap. Uh, how do you see the role of IOPA uh, trying to help com uh, commercial insurance buyers to ideally close the protection gap? Yeah, so let me start with, is there a role for IOPA, Prudential and a conduct supervisor to deal with, with protection gaps? And, and we've published a paper actually when it comes to particularly to climate change risk and the physical risks of so being able to insure against these risks. We've published a report before summer and it clearly shows that there are uh, protection gaps uh, um, out there in, in, in Europe. And, and we asked ourselves the question also as a board, so with all the national supervisors, what is our role? Um, from a prudential perspective, it's not very big. If you look at it micro, because if it's not insured, it's not a risk for the insurer, but at a macro level, of course, the, the, the meaning of, of insurance and the, the being of insurance is that you help society deal with risks. And from that perspective, of course, it's important that risks can be insured when, when necessary. How can AOPA uh, work on that, help on that? What I said at the beginning, I think we have a lot of data available on, on the risks uh, and, and on the gaps. We can share that. Um, we worked on a NETCAT dashboard, so a dashboard that identifies natural catastrophe risk. We are in a pilot phase, but almost at the end, we want to publish that open source just to make sure that people have information on where the gaps are. And finally, we will contribute to um, the dialogue that the commission is starting from DJ Climate and DJ FISMA on, um, on protection gaps, particularly in the field of, of natural catastrophe. And I think what we add to that discussion is we know the risk, we understand how it works insurance, we have no commercial interest. And, and with that, I think we can help the discussion because I do think we need to have many and I think well-informed discussions in the private sector, but also between public and private to deal with this issue going forward because the gaps are really there. Yeah, of course. And, and you already spoke about natural catastrophes, which are typically linked to climate change. Um, so another big theme here of this conference was actually the transition. And uh, Firma has recently published a white paper ensuring the transition, and this is about the transition to a carbon neutral economy and how the insurance sector can basically contribute to this. Um, as I said, um, insurance buyers are expecting restrictions on insurance cover for their individual transition activities. Um, so, I mean, again, how can IOPA support us, the corporate insurance buyers, um, so to speak, uh, to get more support from the insurance industry in making the transition to carbon neutrality again? So, so is there any view from a regulatory perspective uh, to ease certain regulations, uh, to make it easier for insurers to come up with capacity, come up with uh, the decent wordings we need um, to transfer risks associated to this transition process. So also to make it easier for them to support the use of new technology, innovative technology, which helps corporates to gain a more, in that sense, sustainable and more carbon neutral business model. Yeah, thanks, Dirk. And th those are a lot of questions. And I think we can discuss this also long, but I'll, I'll try to be very concise. Now, just very practically, it's not our role to really be involved in decisions by insurers, whether or not to pro provide coverage. H having said that, and I just said it, I do think that in order to be meaningful as an insurance industry, you want to be able to provide uh, cover and, and for risk and, and peace of mind in a way for businesses uh, to, to operate. So I, I think uh, we, we should look into that and, and through the methodology we published and the data we share, we hope we can contribute to that. Um, what we can do additionally here, and, and I think this is also important, is that we really emphasize that we're discussing about a transition. And so um, green finance is, is not about being green, it's about becoming green. I've heard that we've, others say, and I very much agree with that. Now, there's room for that in the regulation. If you only look at the new uh, sustainable finance disclosure um, regulation, where you financials have to report what they do uh, and what they finance, there's an article that says you, you just don't, you just get out and then you don't insure or you don't invest anymore. But what you could also say 
say, of course, is that you you use your role through stewardship and you motivate the transition. So transition, transition plans, I think, is very important to have a role uh, for as a society. We need to understand that we will, we cannot be green in everything today. It is a transition. So that message, I think, we can support as well. Now, in the proposals uh, of the Commission on Solvency Two, we we were also asked to look into a risk differentials for Solvency Two. So the capital requirement, do you do brown, do you do green? Is there a necessity? Um, this, of course, is still under negotiation, so there has to be a final text to do that. What I always say is, is when asked that question, we will do the work, but we will do it evidence-based, data-driven, and only identify um, a possibly need for green or brown if we really have the data and the evidence that shows that that will be appropriate. It's about evidence and not preference when we decide and, and we are asked to develop these risk differentials. Yeah. So I think this is where we are. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so you mentioned data quite often already. Um, so of course, this brings me to the other problem which we face. And this is the gap between demand and supply on cyber insurance. Uh, what are your thoughts on this issue? Because as you just said yourself, data data is absolutely key, but this also creates some kind of dependency on data security, of course. Um, so what are, what are what is your position when it comes to cyber insurance? Well, first of all, um, what we of course can can see is what is happening in the market in Europe, and we see an increase both in the uh, number of products that's being offered to insure, as well as the number of insurers that are insuring these risks. At the same time, we see demand go up a lot faster. Um, so I think that is the first. A second is that what we see is that you need to be very conscious of of if cyber risk is, is insured, um, if it is a silent risk in, in, in the policy, or is it maybe in there, but it's going to be excluded at some point because uh, when we focus on a certain risk, an insurer can also decide to stop insuring it. Now, I, one of the things we publish now is, is, is an opinion where we say that if you would exclude it, you would always have to be very explicit to the consumer uh, about uh, the fact that it's no longer insured. Um, having said that, I think the logic going forward on how to deal with this gap is again, have the data, understand the drivers of the risk, assess why there is no products, do not only look at the, the products that are already in the market, look at new products that could be offered, look at different products that could be offered, preferably through what we call um, 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 underwriting with an incentive. So it, while incentivizing the transition, but also, and, and this is what we're also doing, look at why, in, uh, why is cover taken and why not? And when does it become too expensive? Mm -hmm. So I think through this route, we, we do try to also contribute to this discussion. Um, but here I do see the market move, uh, but it's just not moving as fast as the demand is. Yeah, very right so, right? And I, and I think part of the problem is that insurers base their decision on how to design products quite often on loss experience in the past, which is difficult to have if we talk about new and emerging risks like cyber. So that's a little bit a mismatch, so to speak, um, to get where we want to be. Um, you already mentioned also uh, consumer regulation for consumer products and, and, and what are the, the guidelines there. Uh, of course, here we are all commercial insurance buyers, so it's a, it's a quite different kind of client, I would say. Um, so when you reflect on the activities of IOPA in, in the area of consumer protection regulation, um, would you agree that there should be a, a different, let's say, a different emphasis or maybe also a different mindset when it comes to commercial insurance products in terms of the degree of regulation needed for, for these uh, type of insurances or for the insurances for this specific, i.e. commercial customers? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And of course, it's been a question raised by Ferma already many times. Uh, and, and I would say uh, you raise good questions. You're actually also uh, ensuring uh, the transition. I think there was a great document to have and you're really adding from a different angle. Um, some, some good info to, uh, to a discussion that we need to have. So I think that is a first. Um, naturally, uh, the, the focus of IOPA also through the legislation actually is, is, on, uh, is on consumers. Um, 
uh, still, I think uh, when we go uh, when we go forward, and then there is a review of the uh, IDD coming up. Um, I think we we do feel that it would be good to to look again at the what is now the formal distinction between the different classes of consumers that insurers have, and what are the needs per different class. Um, where we are now starting to to take some steps and we'll publish a consumer trends report um, uh, in, in uh, end of this year, beginning of next year. And there you will see also that we already start to mention SMEs. Uh, I think that is a category that maybe is not a consumer, but I think uh, many of the needs of, of that particular part of our economy could be uh, aligned because they're at equal risk of being misled or sold wrong products or having to deal with a gap. So I think this is something that is on our radar. I think we address it first through the step of SMEs. And I think the moment to really look at it will be the IDD review. Uh, but I do think to come back to your question that there are reasons uh, to, to have a, a slightly different treatment of the different group of um, businesses and consumers that would need insurance. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that, that would be much appreciated because I think most corporate uh, or commercial insurance buyers do not really think that they need the same level of protection as, as, yeah. as private insurance customers. Um, this actually brings me already to my, to my last question, which is touching a very different subject, or not a very different, but a slightly different subject. And this is, um, so Ferma, so we were very supportive on, on IOPA's work on, on thinking about uh, what, what was called a, pu a public-private partnership um, that helps cover uh, consumers to find cover for large and complex risks such as the pandemic. Um, so what mandate actually does IOPA have to keep working in this area? Because we are absolutely keen to continue our contribution to this. Um, but honestly, um, there is a little bit of um, a lag now in terms of having or finding a counterparty to actively make steps forward on this important work. Yeah, uh, and, and I, I recognize that. I think it was uh, around the, the time that we published the first report on this. It was a lot of activity and a lot of ideas, but it, that didn't really let then to a lot of uh, activity on the legislative side. Uh, what I think therefore is positive is that at least for, for climate uh, change risk and for net get risk and, and the insurability thereof, there will be a round table right now uh, um, this autumn and uh, there will be a cooperation between DG Climate and FISMA in Brussels. Um, going back to what I said at the start, what we think our role in, in here is that we we really are able to, to assess the risk, to listen to the arguments. Often arguments come with huge numbers and, and why it's not insurable. Um, I think we can assess the numbers. But what I also say is that the starting point of that discussion has to be that there are risks that insurers want to uh, insure society's risks and that there are possibilities to do that, first of all, maybe through new products, um, but that there are different angles to look at. So also look at why are people not buying it? Uh, what can we do to increase demand? Also, how can you underwrite the risk with impact? That means you underwrite it, but you also incentivize to adapt and to mitigate, to lower the outcome of the risk. Um, and finally, there might be this point where you could really say the private solutions uh, the private uh, market cannot solve everything and you need a public solution. And here what we can do is also provide examples of what we already see happening in the market uh, because there's several solutions uh, popping up in different member states. I think you see several member states now saying the first X percentage of loss of crops because of drought will be insured. You need to insure yourselves, but if it comes above a certain level, the state could step in and they, they organize pooling. It's just one example, but there are many more examples out there. So I think in all these areas, we can provide this technical information data, assess the information that is shared, and then hopefully bring this discussion forward, because I fully agree it's something that we need to continue to, uh, to have as a dialogue. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Thanks very much so far. I, I think we have maybe time for two or three other questions and I hand over to Alex to see if there is 
Okay, let's, uh, um, I hope that uh, Peter can stay with us. Uh, please uh, make yourselves known if you would uh, like to uh, ask a question. But uh, Charlotte, I can see, uh, would like to, uh, Charlotte from the, the firm board. Uh, go ahead, could you ask your question to Petra? Yeah, thank you very much, Petra, for an interesting uh, intervention. Yesterday, we heard Commissioner Marko Sefcovic also um, stressing the importance of uh, the insurers so I would like to know if you could elaborate a little bit further on what you see is the most important role for the risk managers, also for risk managers working more in the enterprise risk area. Yeah, I think that when it comes to sustainability risk, because I think that that's what we're uh, uh, focusing on, uh, I think what is important, and we see it too little yet, is that you really look at sustainability from the risk perspective. So how is it going to impact both my clients and then through the clients, me, uh, and also how it is already directly impacting my company. And that me, that's challenging uh, because it means you need to think forward in scenarios because you can't lean on the data you have. Now, particularly the NGFS, of course, has published several scenarios, but also we ourselves have published some ideas on, on how you could do climate scenarios going forward. We've provided advice to how you can do that in an own risk solvency assessment and application guidance. So I think there are now some and more and more documents coming out on how you could really include it in the core of your risk management. But the point is that you have to start doing that. That's one. And, and the last time we looked, it was the, 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 uh, the percentage of insurers that really has it in their own resolvency assessment is, is still too little. And I can imagine that holds also for other corporates. Um, and second, you have to really think in scenarios because there are different out there. And it has to be long term. But uh, because sustainability is, is long, but you have to complement that with sh some short-term scenarios. Because even if you think long-term, a big fun, a big storm or a big flooding this year will have impact as well. And I think it is something that we do not yet do, uh, uh, and, and at least in insurance, not everyone is yet doing it. Steps are being made, but I think as a board, this is what you want to see happening. And this is, and this is why for us it's through the ORSA. It has to be reported to board level as well. And I think that is, uh, I think, a very important way to at least understand what we're up against. Thank you. Okay, Charlotte seems uh, uh, quite happy with that sir, reply. We'll see you uh, later on the in the afternoon. Um, I see there's somebody uh, here. Would you like to? Uh, uh, yeah, the long, young lady, maybe, who wanted to ask the question. Could you? Uh, oh no, it's the the yes. Pardon, uh, Alizy, uh, votre question. Yes, I am um, Philippe Cotel, Vice President of Ferma. I've got two questions on digital insurance, cyber insurance. Um, one is about uh, open insurance and how do you see open insurance as a, as a key challenge for commercial insurance buyers in order to maybe unleash the, this market? Second question, which uh, maybe you saw in France, the French Ministry of Finance has issued a report on uh, cyber insurance and uh, among other conclusions of that report was the possibility, the eventuality, to create a new dedicated insurance branch for cyber in order to improve transparency, competitiveness, and professionalism on that branch. So, so these are maybe what, where I would like your opinion on that as well. Yes, yeah, thank you very much for the question. So. Um, Maybe on open insurance, um, this is, of course, through open data and, and, and the discussion of, of open data, uh, a topic that is on our agenda. The, the concrete use case and, and how that is going to help, I think the concrete use case in general of open insurance, we're still a little bit searching there also as, as, as a supervisory community. Uh, and we actually now working on a on developing a use case, which will be a dashboard uh, of, of insurance so that consumers can see what they are insured for. Um, this is something we're developing just to better understand what the opportunities of open insurance would be. Um, thinking about open insurance in the context of dashboards uh, could indeed have refer more and more to, to cyber and what risks are there and the sharing of data on, on what is cyber risk. That could be something to be used going forward as well, but it, it, that's definitely something that will need more time to further develop. At a moment that the realization that these data are valuable also, of course, becomes part of the 
of the overall puzzle that we then need to deal with. <laughs> as for setting up cyber as a, as a, as a separate branch, um, that could be a route um, uh, to, to maybe also uh, develop the, 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 the supply side of that insurance better. At the same time, I think that the current reasons why uh, the, the supply is less than the demand, um, I don't think that is only the, the, the fact that, that you need this branch. I think there's, there's more hurdles to take to, uh, to get to a, a better provision of, of cyber insurance. And it has to do with data and, and the risk and the ability to actually underwrite the risk in a way that you can then deliver also quality to your value for money. I think that's always our theme, but also here. Okay, Philippe, thank you. Uh, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, I do. Okay, yes. very good, thank you. Uh, well, anybody, then, please feel free if you want to start. Yes, uh, please, uh, if you could just uh, introduce yourself so that uh, Petra uh, knows who she's replying to. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Benoit Altrani, Lloyds Europe. Thanks for the insight. Uh, I understand that public-private partnership is one of the solution. Uh, I think everybody agrees about that. It looks like there is not a lot of success for the moment. What would be, in your view, the conditions in order to make it happen? Yeah, so uh, it's not a success at the moment. That's not a European thing, by the way. We have an EU-US dialogue where we discussed this as well, but we also looked at how much public-private is now coming into being, because it's discussed a lot, uh, and, it, and it's not really you know, getting that much track yet. Um, again, I think what, we, what the discussion needs to start from, and it doesn't, most of the time these discussions start with insurance saying, hi society, do you know you have an XXX billion risk, and we can't insure it, so we need public money. I, I make it very blunt, very short now. But, and, and then I think uh, the political level has a lot of concerns these days, unfortunately, and they just hear a big number. And I think then it, it dies a slow death. So I think if you start that discussion from the capabilities that you do have as an industry, and I think I must say, in, in all fairness, that narrative of industry is already changing. And I think the whole focus of Insurance Europe and its conference was really taking the angle, what can we do? We want to insure these risks. So I think that's the start. Um, be fair about the numbers, be clear about what you need. And I think it's much more than, than the public part. It's also what kind of products would you like to offer? What do you need to offer that? What can we do to incentivize people to take the cover, but also to do the adaptation? And then what would be a moment where, where it would be too much? And can you then find combined products where you still incentivize people to also take their share uh, of, of, of covering for possible losses? And where would you need the government to step in? And how would you do that in a time that a lot of capital is needed for transitions um, for dealing with the macroeconomic circumstances. So I think it really requires a, a holistic thinking around how we're going to deal with this, uh, this topic. And again, as I say, we're, we're very dedicated to, to contribute to that in a very constructive way. Okay, Petra, we have three more minutes. Uh, if we can just abuse your time uh, one more. Do we have uh, any questions? Uh, Charles, I think uh, uh, Charles has a question uh, here. Go for it. Hi, Petra. Charles Lowe from Firma. Um, a big topic in our membership right now is captives. And I know uh, Firma has interacted a lot with EOPA around Solvency 2. It's obviously in political discussions right now, but when we've talked over these past days about all the big risks, a lot of commercial insurance buyers are saying and really emphasizing the importance of captives. And I wonder if you could share with the audience in a very short time, yeah, what uh, you are thinking about captives, that would be very, very much appreciated. Thanks. Thank you, Charles. And, uh... Well, what I can say about captives is, of course, that it is, um, it's been a part of insurance and, and the way 
uh, particularly corporate insurer, uh, I think that has been uh, very important also to deal with the risks of corporates. Um, what what I what I've been told is that it's it's actually developing further now that in some parts of of our economy insurability is becoming an issue. So I think hey, it, it it's it's uh, it's something to stay and then it's fulfilling a function. I think that's it. I think at the second time, when you look at uh, uh, captives from a supervisory perspective, proportionality is key and, and it's there. And this is also, I think, the part of the Solvency II review that, that will be interesting for, uh, uh, for that part of our insurance market. Uh, for um, uh, the, the, the small, non-complex and, and, and who do you impact uh, when you have a problem, I think all that is is very relevant when you look at a captive and also how you should supervise uh, captives. Um, finally, uh, I also see structures with captives, uh, but that still include a cross-border component. And, and I think here, even though you could, uh, you still have the proportionality argument, I think a little closer look in a cross-border context is always wise, speaking as a prudential supervisor. So there I, I would, would still be very conscious of the cross-border impact. But, but I think that those are the parts. So it's a key part of our industry, of, 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 our, of, of my, my sector. Um, it, it fulfills a function. It, it may become even more important, at least in the near future. It should be supervised proportionate uh, and we should be very conscious of those structures that include cross-border. Hope that answers a bit. Okay, so, thank, so. thank you very much Petra. Thank you again for your time and being with us today and the valuable insights Recording in progress. IOPA's work on commercial insurance. Um, again, thanks very much. I think uh, we should plan to continue this fruitful discussion in one year uh, again. Um, because it's of course very beneficial for, for our audience here to, to listen and to get first-hand insights in, in your work. So again, thanks very much and Thank you. goodbye, have a good day.